Hello, I'm Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. I started my career with an internal medicine residency and followed that with three years of work as an emergency physician. I then returned to training for a radiology residency and a fellowship in body and MSK MRI. In the course of my over 20 years in radiology, I have worked as a private practice radiologist, an academic radiologist, and for the last 17 years as a teleradiologist for VRAD. I have been the chief medical officer there for eight years and am licensed to practice in all 50 states. Emergency neuroradiology, and I've broken these into a collection of emergency cases and a collection of trauma cases. So we'll be looking at 48 neuro cases. These are all non-contrast head CTs. All right, internal cerebral vein thrombosis. I can tell you this one resides in my own personal hall of shame. It was my first year out in private practice and I just whiffed this thing. Uh, this was an elderly chemotherapy patient. They get dehydrated and are thus at risk for this particular entity. You can see I missed a, a hypodense putamen. In fact, the thalami are both hypodense as well. Uh, this was not my best moment. In fact, I missed this as well. The internal cerebral veins are far too dense. And we'll track those throughout their course. Uh, the one thing I did spot was this little hemorrhagic lacune, uh, the least, in fact, of her problems. So here we go with the movie version. You can see there are the hypodense thalami and right putamen. And now we can track those internal cerebral veins up from their confluence at the vein of Galen. And there they are in the floor of the lateral ventricles. We'll let that run through again. There are the hypodensities that should have been called and the hyperdense internal cerebral veins. And here again in the floor of the lateral ventricles. I can't look at that case without remembering an oncologist coming in the next day, pulling up this case and telling me he felt that the internal cerebral veins should not be that dense. So that was a great moment. All right, our next one, this is a wild case. You hear all the time about the delta sign and just when you think you understand that, you hear about the empty delta sign. Uh, and, Obviously, on a non-contrast study, a dense or a thrombose superior sagittal sinus will take on the appearance of a delta. And in a contrasted study, it'll look like an empty delta with a hypodense clot outlined by contrast. But check this out. Now, that tentorium can often be dense, and it can actually uh, give you a, a little pause. Right? Sometimes it can be so prominent and so dense, even in normal circumstances. But this is far, far beyond even that. And you can see actually this hypodense clot right here in the torcular region. And we'll watch that extend up the superior sagittal sinus. In fact, it causes so much engorgement of the tent and the dura that it gives you essentially an empty delta finding on a non-contrast scan. So there it is in the transverse sinuses. You can see, you can see it even in the straight sinus there. Right? That's an empty delta sign on a non-contrast study due to the engorgement and density of the tent and dura. Not the kind of thing you'll see every day. All right, so that's a dural sinus thrombosis. Our next one, got a basilar artery density right there. And the unusual finding here is this pontine hypodensity. Uh, you just don't see people make it to the ER with that extensive uh, an injury to their pons. So this is a fairly unusual one. I will tell you, we had uh, quite the challenging pre-employment test with, in the early days of VRAD. Everyone that was hired had to pass a pretty tough test, and this was actually one of them. Uh, just checking to be sure that someone 
had the guts to call a pontine hypodensity uh, such as this. You know, there's always such artifact in the in the region. Uh, it takes a takes a little bit of resolve to make that call. So that's a basilar artery thrombosis and a pontine infarct. This patient did not do well. Our next one, this is one of my favorites. Very tough call, but present nonetheless. Right there in the carotid canal, you can see there is density in the right internal carotid artery. In fact, when we watch the movie, you'll be able to track that density right up through the carotid canal. It's pretty impressive. The interesting thing about this case, though, is that density resulted in this infarct in the occipital region. You can see that cytotoxic edema running right out to the periphery of the cortex, and that was actually the patient's presentation. So look again at that carotid canal. You can track that density all the way up. And know that that is the vessel that's out. And there again, the cytotoxic edema in the right occipital region. Let's watch that again. Again, watch the carotid canal on the right. There it is. See how you can actually track that density on multiple slices. Quite a treat. So how can that happen? Well, you might have seen earlier, it's a fetal PCA origin. Right? That right PCA is coming off the internal carotid, and so a carotid clot can result in an occipital infarct. All right, our next one. This is a thrombosis of the posterior cerebral artery, the left one. The reason I like this one is on this particular slice, it really looks like it's just part of the petroclinoid ligament. So pretty tricky. That anterior portion is actually the thrombosed vessel. I don't think you'd have missed it because there is a pretty large infarct, obviously, in the uh, lower temporal region here. This is a nice one to track through and you pick it up there, it really does look like a petroclinoid ligament, but then you can track that dense vessel all the way back. And there again is the infarct. And a little involvement there of the left thalamus as well. So that is a thrombosed left posterior cerebral artery. All right, our next one. Well, you all know the dense MCA, but have you seen a simultaneous dense ACA? And that's what this patient had. You can see in the left frontal region there, we're already starting to get cytotoxic edema. We've lost the subinsular ribbon as well. So this is going to be a pretty significant infarct. Pretty significant thrombus burden. You can see it way out in the MCA and way up there in the anterior cerebral. And there is that left frontal infarct and the loss of the subinsular ribbon. This is the follow-up from the next day. And there is the persistent density of the MCA, persistent density of the ACA, and look at the evolution of that left frontal infarct. There it is again, still extending all the way out. And those left frontal infarcts really prominent here, even superiorly. So that is a thromboembolism with infarcts resulting in a dense MCA and ACA. Thank you, Shaft, for that one. All right, another, and this is a classic complication. You can see the hyperdense MCA. Higher up, there is a region of hypodensity, cytotoxic edema, again, extending to the periphery of the brain and consistent with an acute infarct. But here is the dread complication. Got this kind of linear density that is consistent with cortical petechial hemorrhage or hemorrhagic conversion of this large infarct. You know, back in when I was just a kid, 
uh, we called these hyperdense MCAs and they were considered an absolute contraindication to TPA or any other kind of thrombolytics. Now they've obviously expanded that massively and they have given these to people. Uh, in fact, I saw, uh, they give TPA to these all the time now. I saw a few uh, publications that actually track the distance of clotted MCA and correlated the outcome with TPA as a result. So how times change. But this was the concern, right? That if you had a hyperdense MCA, your infarct would be so large that statistically it was too great a risk uh, to give someone TPA. The assumption was with that much tissue at risk, uh, you were just bound to have some region that degraded to the point of hemorrhage. That's a very nice case of a hemorrhagic conversion of a previous right MCA infarct. All right, another dense MCA, but this one with a very unusual uh, complication. Right, you can see the hypodense putamen and can expect obviously that this infarct is pretty well done, right? There's not a, not a lot of salvageable tissue there. Pretty well defined, pretty hypodense, that region in the right putamen. There you can see it. And there's a little involvement of the caudate as well, higher up. But look at this. Two days later, this is that patient's scan. And it looks like everything has gone back to right, doesn't it? Well, obviously, no. The internal capsule, the uh, subinsular region, they're all too hypodense still. And what this actually represents is what's called pseudo-normalization. This patient is actually hemorrhaged into that compromised right putamen and caudate, and it has all the appearance of a normal brain, but this is actually a pretty serious complication. So that is pseudo-normalization of a right thromboembolic infarct.